Um, let's start with, well, welcome. Welcome. Um, sorry about last month. I really, I really couldn't send out what I wrote. It, it was, you all would have lost any modicum of respect <laughs> that you might have had. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for your indulgence. And let's go with introductions for the camera. Okay. I'm Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I'm Rebecca Turner, designee for the Department General. James Pepper, designee for the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. David Chair, designee for the Attorney General's Office. Uh, Jeff Jones at large. Fred Goff here, Criminal Justice Training Council. Jed Furpo, uh, Criminal Justice Training Council. Uh, Don Stevens, uh, I have a uh, Brian Grierson, uh, Judiciary Designee. Uh, Monica Weaver, the Designee for the Department of Corrections. Gary Scott, the uh, Designee for the Department of Public Safety and State Police. And Eitan Nesred and Longo, Chair. And Rebecca. Uh, Jessica? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, announcements. Jessica's on the phone. <laughs> um, the only other regret that I got was from Sheila Linton, who just couldn't make this particular Tuesday. So that's that's it for the announcements. I have any that other people have. That would be no. Okay, moving right along. The minutes from the meeting of. April 30th, which sort of was our last meeting, and it never mind. Anybody? <laughs> uh, changes, addenda. Okay, anybody want to make a motion? I'll move the Seconds? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All abstaining? Motion. Carried, we approve them. Thank you, David, for your mutual, um, what would be the word? Trial. <laughs> um, I wanted, but I, the agenda that I put up was and sent out to you was kind of a little distracted. Um, what I wanted to put in here, I put it on the agenda that you have at the moment, is a brief presentation discussion, it really is going to be brief, of the race and traffic stop data for last year for the Vermont State Police. It was released in June. There was a fair and impartial committee meeting in June. Uh, it's been on CAX and all the rest of it, but I think that there's a certain overlap between the work of that group and the work that we're doing, maybe a bit tangential, but it's still there. So I asked um, Captain Scott to give us a little short presentation on that so that you can see where that's at. Go ahead. All right. So we are required by law to uh, submit our data every year. Every law enforcement agency in the state must have it in by September. Uh, we usually should have it in by June at our fair and impartial policing meeting. We, uh, we have a woman that works for the state police that does all this data internally. Um, and so we, since the major release in 2015, we have sort of learned where we made a lot of mistakes and how to have correction training of troopers, uh, making sure we're capturing all the data on uh, correctly. There was a lot of uh, errors being made when it came to duplication from uh, multiple tickets issued on a traffic stop to crashes. So, you know, uh, an example would be like a DUI crash and having that uh, person counted multiple times in the data and making sure we were cleaning that up because you have an arrest, you have a crash report, you had a traffic stop, the, whatever the tickets they were issued in, was that put under a movie violation or um, uh, an investigation stop. So there's been a lot of training since 2015 that has gone into where we're seeing we, uh, we are having significant reduction in errors in our data. This year we had uh, 0.05% uh, of errors in our data, but we're still seeing areas where we uh, troopers are making mistakes and not capturing data, particularly arrests. An example would be an excessive speed on the interstate. A person going 110 miles an hour, a trooper runs radar, decides to pull them over, and they're going to arrest them immediately. They get out, 
and they arrest them, they bring them back and give them a citation and go to court. That's an example where they still need to issue uh, traffic stop paperwork, either a warning or a traffic ticket to them. So we've gone back through the, all the barracks to find, uh, you know, through auditing to determine that we were capturing all of that too. So there was some changes in this year uh, for some error rates that went up from 0.025% to 0.05%. That was really the big reason why we saw that. Uh, we are still seeing disparate rates when it comes to uh, searches of black operators. And another big point is this is all just operator information. Uh, the upcoming year, we'll see a change in the back of the traffic ticket for passenger searches. And that training should be going out pretty soon. Uh, Mr. Gauthier and I will be meeting this week to help finalize that for the local agencies. And I will present the first training on this to the state police this week as well. So to capture, you know, uh, if the passenger is the focus of the search now, that information will be captured on the back of the traffic ticket. But still, training hasn't gone out with that. So I'm guessing within the next year, we'll see some hiccups again of uh, how that's being captured and what errors we run into. So that will be a learning process again, much like this traffic stop uh, data is that we've seen. But uh, for the most part, we made uh, about 58,000 total car stops. Um, externally generated means things that where the, the trooper isn't making the discretion to stop that vehicle. So that's the pull out of this type of stuff. He gets information from an outside source, uh, BOL, uh, 911 call taker, uh, another officer uh, puts information out to have that vehicle stop. That's externally generated. Um, suspicions of DUI can also sometimes be in there if it's hot, depending upon how it comes in. But basically the focus of the traffic stop data for us is the discretionary stops that the trooper is making and what that means. So as we look, if you really you know, that's the nuts and bolts of it is down at the bottom, we see search rates excluding externally generated, and you'll see under black operators that 1.63%. And that has remained, it's gone down, but it still is uh, an area of concern for us and why that hasn't leveled out completely. So a black operator is still three times more likely to be searched. Um, so, and you can see if you look up, there's only 30-ish, 25 total searches out of the 58 total thousand car stops that we had. So, but it's still an area, and the graph on the next page sort of shows up where we're, we're getting close together. It's come down significantly since the release in 2015. Uh, but it's still not all the way there yet of where we would exactly like it to be. And you know, Professor Seguino advised us that what a perfect world could sort of look like is a, a crisscross of that or a leveling out of that. And so that's still an area where we're shooting and not we're still don't have exact reasons of why that continues to occur other than you know implicit, explicit bias that's occurring and you know, with the multitude of training, but we're happy to see that it's continued to get closer together. The other big issue that we're looking at is that back graph of tickets issue is uh, black operators are still being ticketed at a higher rate than white operators. And again, that's uh, an area of confusion for us as we look to the last, you know, since 2015 to 2018, uh, you see, we have a significant change of you know, road troopers that are on the road in uniform making traffic stops. With all this training, all of the messaging, we're still seeing that disparate rate in there. And that's an area we still can't really quite understand how, what we're missing in that piece there, or why that continues to be in there, even though you see a pretty significant change over of new road troopers that are out there usually doing the, you know, the, the, the bulk of this traffic stop work. So it's not the old guard, so to speak, of troopers that are out there really making the most traffic stops. It's a newer trooper. So that's an area where we're still continuing to tackle. We have bringing community members, Aton uh, and uh, Curtis Reed, and uh, do the training. We have informal leaders training, but this is still you know, sort of uh, the area we're still looking at and trying to tackle why these discoveries are in there. And, you know, and with such a small data set, it's difficult sometimes. So what we do uh, going forward is every station commander is held responsible for looking at the stops in their station um, and then drilling down because you know you get back when it gets to 25 30 it's probably going to be well five to four in some stations and they pull out those traffic stops 
and look at the, what they pull the ticket, they review the video, and to put all that together to see what actually happened on those stops. We also did not receive any internal complaints related to racial disparities last year through our internal affairs process. So that's sort of a quick, down and dirty look at that. All this data is on our website, uh, also it's every year. It's also sent to the CRG. Happy to answer any questions. So the disparity that we were talking about for tickets is this 40% down here. That are 1.63. Oh yeah, for the tickets. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're correct. It's 40 compared to 36. Correct. And 50% are Asian. Correct. And the Asian number, and that's a uh, through training is a. And it's we're going back and forth again about who is captured in the Asian category. Sometimes uh, uh, people uh, Arabic, you know, sort of just, you know, backgrounds may be captured in that. Sometimes not. Depends on who we go. Our training says that a person of Middle Eastern descent should be going to the Asian category. So that's our, a little bit of a change right there through the last two years. So, um, but it's in another area we'll continue to look at. And you said you you internally put these things together, all of the charts. Yes. And the Professor Sabrina do any analysis or statistical testing on it? She takes this and has, and that's on our webpage also, what she's done. She's done two different reports that are both on our webpage that she's doing. The first one from 2015, and then a deeper dive that she did of the 2015 data. But she got on CAX and did an interview in regard. She was there, then I released the okay. data, yeah. and she's looked at it. The I only think. reason I ask, it's a, it's a wonky question, of course, but it's just because there's such a small number of people in the data set that it's yes. hard sometimes to compare percentages. So <coughs> I mean, they are what they are. I'm not disputing right, them. Right, yeah. right. That's what I'm saying. She it's gave us long some long. praise to us. Yeah. 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 But she, she, yeah. She's a partner with us and how we look at this and the work that we're doing. Yeah. No, and Jeff, you were there also uh, that night. So I think she was pretty yeah. overall positive and thinks we're going in the right direction. Yeah, 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 you know what have to remember? She's the daughter of a New York City cop, and her uncle was a New York City cop. So she, she gets it. You know, very much gets it. And I think that's an important thing to remember because everyone has bias. And her bias is maybe less than like people think it might be, right? I'm going to say I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on who you, who you yeah. really you know. Now, Dr. Sinclair, your yeah. data that you share is not matched by other local law enforcement agencies. Is that right? So I, mean, I understood that from Dr. Sinclair. Of what we're putting out, what other That's right. So you, to your credit, for sharing. We're doing all this. Other agencies are just required to put it into CRG for a raw yes. dump. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and just so I understand, just taking one example, sure. the Asian hit rate here for searches, contraband found searches, is 100%. Right. So, but then the arrest from searches is only 40%. Right. So, am I to understand that? Searches done 100% of the time for Asians stopped. Something was found. Something was found, but 60% of those were just not arrested? Right. They could have been ticketed. I see. You would consider like pot contraband, but it's under the legal limit. Right. So or cigarette. Like what cigarette. Else so it could be alcohol. Okay. It could be okay. Other okay. Other okay. So not an arrestable offense, but a, a fine in one way or another. We're doing great with our community. Keep it up. Don't take it. I'm not sure I have to call out the warriors. We're doing a great job. I'm not, I'm not so anyway, so keep it up. Could I ask you just to expand a little bit on, on the status of other agencies? Um, I mean, you know, you know, I know what I've heard you yeah. before, but I think many people at this table don't understand that. I find some lacking in, in, in some other agencies. Yeah, it's, I don't think I can really completely comment on that other than knowing that the resources are difficult to really put all in. The person that does this for us does this on overtime in addition to our regular duties. And that's because she enjoys it. Like she's into it, that sort of thing that she likes to do. So I think it's very difficult for a smaller agency, five, six people to really have to you know, find the funding to really get someone to do it. So they're, they're doing, that and there's no other requirement other than from the law other than to dump into CRG. 
Okay. So as long as they're meeting that requirement, they're in compliance with the yeah, Obviously that. I don't know if Rick might want to jump in that a little bit more. Here. Yeah, probably Rick really doesn't want to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that there's a method to that question, obviously, you and I are both aware of it. I'd like to consider that this might be a place where resources could be placed at uh, made available to other departments to do this level of work. That's, that's really like where I was going. So I, I will jump in a little bit. I'm aware that CRG put a proposal in front of government operations regarding what they would need to kind of simplify the solid data collection reporting process. And as you can imagine, it's a resource issue. Uh, CRG came up with something that um, they had pitched to us. And for whatever reason, I couldn't tell you, I didn't make the cut in bills that were sent to the governor. I don't know where it went, I don't know why it went, where it went. Uh, but I do know that CRG had been taking a look at the whole making the report easily obtainable and interpreted by anybody who wanted to visit the website. I suspect it's going to come back up again this year in this legislative session. I haven't talked to Karen. Um, I've been communicating. I get some agencies send their reports to me and I simply forward them to Karen. Um, so we have a little brief email exchange. As we get closer to the legislative session, we'll touch base again on what exactly it is that um, she's put together. I suspect we'll probably get uh, a little more receptivity this upcoming session, perhaps whatever it is she's got. And I, I wish I'd come prepared to tell you what it was. Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, I can get that from her in real life. But the, um, she had a proposal, really simple part of everything. She was pretty enthusiastic about it. Did it get to by either House or Senate? I know it went to Senate. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know if it went to House. This is one of the few sessions that I had almost nothing to do with House Club. So I know I went to Senate and talked to the chair, Jeanette White, and she'd seen that. Um, and then that was the last I knew of anything. Um, probably could have tracked that better, but that was up to my armpits and alligators my own this last legislative session. So I just unfortunately didn't track that as well as I as I should have. We track those bills too online. We you know, got a bill number, you can see where they go and where the <coughs> committees are in and where the readings are. I mean, that's what I do with my stuff, too. You know, I, I, got, I got the sense, too, that it's, it is a lot of resource issue. I think what I've, I, what I've been hearing is that the place where the data is being compiled, in this case, CRG, that it is hard to then get at that raw data to get independent review of it. That what CRG is then doing, as I understand, is sort of summarizing reports, put it into reports. But to get the raw data that you are probably providing to CRG is actually not easy, I understand, mm -hmm. for someone who is not CRG. Now, that is problematic because, as we have seen as our own panel, we had CRG come, but there are competing reports, there are, there are questions about how do we get checks on what person or expert is doing. And so, I think that for us, if we're going to make a recommendation um, that, hey, we want to keep seeing the data. I want to see data being provided not just from state troopers but from local so we can get a sense that we have to trust that who's collecting the data is actually going to give us the raw data. Well, so that's, that that's the other challenge for CRG. Karen had told, I talked to her a couple of times over the submission of the data, and it's supposed to come in with, uh, it's supposed to come in as aggregate, not identifying uh, information, and it is literally all over the map, what she gets. So CRJ spends a fair amount of time cleaning the data that they get. And they found that, um, depending on the format which agency had submitted, they may have to go back to the agency and work with them to get that resubmitted in the format that they can accept. Uh, um, so there's, there's a couple of issues, and those sorts of things were what she was talking about uh, with regards to simplifying that process. The, um, I, I think, Captain, as we look at this training, I think there's probably room for a component for agency heads on the tail end of that, how to put the reports together. But this is, I mean, I call it the jet, 
the uh, jet plane sent to the uh, fuel getting up, but once you're at altitude, it's a lot less resource to keep it going. It's the same thing with this process that Karen's talking about. You'll burn resources getting up there, but once you're up there, uh, the maintenance costs are significantly reduced. The last point I would say is that second page is what we're finding over and over again. It's just sort of that consistency of what we're talking about uh, census population and driving population. Um, so you can see for uh, black operators, it was 2.9%. That's crash data. The top chart is just from crash data. And then the bottom chart is from motor vehicle stop data. So you can just kind of compare that. Uh, the driving population has increased for people of color in Vermont over the last couple of years that we're seeing when it comes to sort of crash and motor vehicle stop and not and not it's not as consistent with the census population that we have for numbers. Hmm. What are you comparing that data to the census? This, so yeah, the census data for like uh, for blacks is like one point three percent. Oh so okay. our drivers I don't know are, that. Uh, of just total state, uh, right. just total population census data is 1.3 percent. But we're talking about just drivers, and that's all. So the top one is anyone that's been involved in a motor vehicle crash is in the top part of that, that the operator vehicle is, and the bottom one is just motor vehicle stops of what we're seeing for percentages. And, and just to clarify, the, the crash data is considered to be a reasonable proxy for the driving population as a whole. Yes. And there's different methods of how you pull that out. We took all crashes with this. Okay. So some, some researchers would say you only take uh, the non at fault driver. So there's different ways. So you know, they're, they're just in the same sort of parte in that right. incident. So right. there's, we took all, because some crashes had seven cars involved, and we figured we'd just get it. We want to see what that would like for us to say. Have you memorized, I'm sorry, have you memorized the numbers for, for whites and Asians? Uh, whites are 94%, 96% right in that range. 94, 96? Yeah, I don't But so it's still showing disparate Absolutely. treatment. Okay, I just want to make sure. And that, is that across the board too for other races, perceived races, that Native Americans and Asians? For, for what? Well, when comparing the total demographics compared to the stopped. For census compared to? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's, the, the numbers are not the same. Yeah. And they're all left increased. Increased. Yes. Except for white. Yes. Yeah, except for white. Okay. Other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Well, That leads really easily into a discussion of the draft for our report. I, I was, as we were talking just now, I was thinking, I had, I thought I'd written something about data. You did. Was the real data. Yeah, but maybe we need to beef it up um, and make it more pointed. There, thank you. <laughs> there it is. Um, but it's on page three at the top, first bullet point. Um, but it may need to be more pointed. I don't know. Um, why don't we just do this starting with you? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm left-handed, so I always go like this. So <laughs> I don't understand the right. Um, that didn't matter. Um, in any event, uh, why don't we just go? I think we should just sure. go around and get reactions, criticisms, suggestions for changes, et cetera, et cetera. And David, dear. I'm ready. <laughs> React. <laughs> so Go I'll start off. And so uh, I, for first, let me thank you, because I do really appreciate the effort, the work that went into this. Oh. Uh, the scope, I think, was really helpful. I appreciated getting something to work with, Kim. And I appreciate your openness to, as you just indicated, for us to comment on. So rip it apart. No, no, I'm not going to do that. Feel I, free. And again, I, I don't. Um, some of these areas, to be candid, are not things that I'm that familiar with. Okay. Because my um, involvement is really more in the juvenile justice arena, right? and much of this has to do with the adult system that honestly I don't know that much about. So I'll sort of um, 
start by maybe an overall editing uh, mm -hmm. comment, which sort of relates to the, the back and forth about data. I actually would make a suggestion that with respect to the bullets, that we add a heading. Um, so that it's easier to read. Got so, it. And I have some ideas, but others may have better ones. So that, for example, on that one we just talked about, I call it data collection as headings so people can understand what we're talking about. And I can go through each one of them if it's helpful. Great. But, but so then, so that's sort of the general kind of whatever um, uh, non-substantive comment. But so with respect to the preamble, I do have a, a, a response that I want to be honest and share, and that's and sort of maybe it's acknowledging my being white now. But I think the phrase "white supremacy" was a little hard for me okay. to think about. Um, I would suggest considering using the phrase "institutional racism," um, and part of that is going to, and again, it's a perception issue and being straightforward about it. When I think of white supremacy, I think of the issues in the news about drivers driving into um, uh, uh, protesters. Mm -hmm. And I think the connotation is perhaps more extreme. The point about racism, I think, is really important. And, and obviously, we heard phrases uh, we talked about bias. And there may be other ways to say it, but I will share with you that that's yes. no, uh, please. sort of my comment. Yeah. To, and again, I'm also thinking about my response and also, frankly, the response of others who read it. Okay. So, and again, I'm open to more conversation to be clear in terms of not as if I have mm -hmm. a, um, a sense of, of urgency about it. So then the other sort of minor comment on that opening um, preamble is, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but you refer to the Attorney General's advisory panel. Um, I think it's the legislature who created us, but um, that the um, Attorney General was asked to convene. Okay. And so it's a, um, again, relatively minor point. No, no, I no, no, no. I don't know what I'm doing. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I just, somebody told me I was, it was the attorney general's advice, right. and I just like been preparing that because it's long. Anyway, so I, I, I yeah, so anyway, that's right. Yes. So then, um, my comments. So, so I would, for example, on the first bullet, consider giving a heading of community input on policy. Got it. Um, and again, maybe other ways to say it. With respect to the second bullet, I think just call that training or something like that. Um, the other comment I made about I would like to make on the training section, um, and it's not a it's not a negative, but more a supplement. Is one of the things that I've learned in my um, work is that one shot trainings or even trainings that are continued have value, but honestly, coaching, supervision, uh, ongoing, and then again, Gary just talked about it himself when he talked about putting um, supervisors on notice about what they're responsible for related to this issue are important components. So again, it's education, coaching on an ongoing basis, and I would recommend putting that as a comment or statement that we recognize just saying to entities like me, even to say to my staff, you get a training at orientation and a training every couple of years, that's not good enough. Right. Um, okay. And then data collection, as you said, I think we could perhaps beat be that up. Okay. And, and I, would, I think we can call that data collection. But I okay. think making some of the points that have been made already mm -hmm. today about mm -hmm. uh, approaching that. Uh, and then uh, the notion, and then uh, the, I will sort of uh, back, I, I can't really speak about the section that I saw about um, pre-trial monitors. I just don't know that much. Okay. Um, and then I, I do appreciate the diversion issue. Um, this has come up a lot in, in the juvenile world too, and uh, I think that uh, this is a challenge for all of us, but I do agree that we do want to have a consistent approach to diversion. Uh, and then um, the next section I thought of electronic monitoring. Top four? Yeah, okay, top three, four, thank you. Um, and then uh, the next bullet I would call something like sentencing. Uh, again, I, I don't have much to say, not my work. Um, then the, the last bullet on page four, um, I don't know if to call staffing or workforce, um, or but again, I do appreciate the point about the need for more resources uh, for the stakeholders in the system. Okay. And then again, I, uh, I think that last bullet again is, is sort of related to community input um, on top of page five. Uh, but I, I think it's those are all really important parts. And then the next bullet, I don't have a, a short title, but the notion of discretion um, is really important from my perspective. I appreciated the focus on it. 
um, we sometimes talk about decision points, or sometimes it's, I know we talk about the sequential intercept model, but I think what I took from it, and I suggest emphasizing, is the fact that there's discretion at many points in the process. Yes. And again, we just talked about stops uh, and decisions by law enforcement officers, but every step of the way, and different players. And I think it's worth drawing out a little bit more specifically okay. that every step of the way, there is discretion by stakeholders in the system, and I think that's relevant to clarify. Okay. So I think for me, I'll stop, but oh. I, I really felt that this is a really good first approach and look okay. forward to hearing other comments. Great. I'll be brief. <laughs> I haven't had enough time to really give as thoughtful as you know, close as you did. But also thank you again. You're welcome. I know that I had promised to help you and then did not it's deliver. It's <laughs> 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 time, it's time. It's time. Yeah. <laughs> I made the same promise. <laughs> so, so I think that this is really a great capture of it and a nice reminder of all the work and discussions and topics that we have taken up. And it's been all of you. Know, it's been lot. everybody. It's been a lot. Yeah. I think my, um, and I like the idea, and just listening to you talk about the headings of what each paragraph stands uh, represents in the subject, and started doing that here. Um, I think that when we pull those out and see those as headings, we should, as a group, decide whether or not these are, in fact, the ones that we want to, to focus on and whether we're missing some. And okay. then within each of the headings, training, data collection, diversion, if these are the ones we do go with, one thing to talk about and what we think are problems and ways generally improve. If we settle on some, I think that perhaps this is when we break up into some of smaller groups Great. and delve in and get the expertise and put in the time on a subcommittee level to come up with concrete recommendations. And here is where we don't need to recreate the wheel, and certainly we do in terms of how it applies to Vermont. But there are so many great studies. I will start sharing, we should start sharing, uh, particularly at a sub level, right? Uh, what other jurisdictions done? There have been reports and studies done that we can almost copy or at least set the framework for. So I just thought, ultimately, but really great too, but what I would hope we get would be working towards the legislature would be something much more common. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so I would agree with Ken that that word, words, white supremacy, jumped out at me. Okay. And it was, I think, during one of our very first meetings when um, one of our prior members mentioned white supremacy as the problem. And it took me a number of years, two years, probably working with this group and immersing myself in racial justice issues to really understand what's, what's meant by that because it immediately, you know, conjures images. Uh, yeah, it and, 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 and yeah, but I think that you know that word. I'm not those words. I'm not afraid of putting in a report like this. I just think they would need more context in order to not um, kind of just, especially as the first sentence, to mm -hmm. have people kind of you know put up their guards, put up their, mm -hmm. their hackles, and um, so I mean I, I'd be happy to work with kind of offering some context to what, what's meant by that. Um, um, and then just moving further down about to the third sentence, I think, you know, using some of the statutory language, you know, you say that the, the, um, the panel was convened to make recommendations for amelioration of the effects of white supremacy. I think maybe using some of the actual statutory language there, as I say, the panel was convened for these three purposes, or four, I forget the exact, I have it. Uh, yeah, um, I think that might help just put some guideposts in uh, for the rest of the report. Um, I should just take a step back and thank you very much for doing this work. Oh, okay. you know, it's a tremendous amount of work just putting together the minutes for the one or two times that I did that. It's a tremendous amount of work putting <laughs> this together. It's uh, sure. heroic. It's fun. Yeah, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I have no life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, so going to the third page about the data collection, I think, you know, for me, I know the state police do a great job, but um, it seems to me like there needs to be some sort of independent body. I know CRG was kind of doing it, and it relies a lot on some 
itself problematic in any way, but it might make sense to just mention that, you know, if I'm reporting on myself, you know, there's a possibility that there might be some sort of bias in there. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, there's just one thought there. The two points down about the use of diversion over the objection of the state's attorneys, that's something that our state's attorneys feel very strongly about. We feel like it's a separation of powers issue. You know, the use of diversion is mm -hmm. in the realm of the prosecution, the executive mm -hmm. branch. So, I mean, that's just a recommendation that would need some more. Uh, I haven't heard that argument. <laughs> 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 I'm thinking, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 just, it's, just, it's a very touchy subject for some of our I, I know. Uh, Pepper, I won't, I won't be that. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was a lot from you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it's just one that, you know, I would like, before we submit any final yeah. to really dig into that, and maybe there could be an addendum from the state's attorneys on this point. Or an addendum from the court. Or an addendum from the court. Or, or competing several addendums. Well, I, or, I, I mean, it, sure. But if you want to include it, just write it in. I mean, I, you can put, I don't care. The report can include the debate. Right. Right. That's right. I mean, we could have a minority report for that matter. It was a movie. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a book, actually. Uh, was, <laughs> he said <laughs> Eric. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we, that's possible, and yeah. it may be something that we want to discuss. I mean, no matter what, I think this issue will come up this year. There's a presumption of diversion, I think you even mentioned. Right. Um, that sunsets. Uh, we, it has to come up this year. It's, it's, sun, it's, it's about to sunset, which means that the legislature, no matter what, will determine whether they want to extend it, whether they want to do something along the lines. So how nice we're doing this. Yeah. So no matter what, this issue will come up. So okay. It's I, yeah, I guess I didn't realize. Yeah, that's what that's the Great. Um, I think the next. Uh, the next bullet point on electronic monitoring, yes. I think, would tie nicely into a discussion about the elimination of cash bail. Um, it, you know, I think that uh, in Vermont, we have a constitutional provision that says that all misdemeanors shall be available. So we actually would have, I, you know, if you want to move to a cash bail system that's based on risk as opposed to risk to reoffend, as opposed to uh, flight from prosecution. Mm -hmm. um, it would probably require a constitutional amendment if you want to move to kind of the New Jersey or California model, which eliminated cash bail. Right. But um, I know that there's a desire. I've heard people talk about it in the legislature every year. So there is certainly, if we talked about eliminating cash bail, moving more towards a risk based right. bail system, I think that a recommendation from us might be well received. Um, and I think that that could also tie in with the prior recommendation about pretrial monitors. You know, mm -hmm. if you combine electronic monitoring with a system of pretrial monitors, you know, I think that's what the federal system is. I, may I delegate? Yeah. I'm, sure. I'm batting my baby blues again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I would just say that the pretrial monitors is a program yeah, at the Attorney General's right. office. Uh, well, well yeah. kind of. I mean, Man, you people are like passing the buck. Yeah. It's yeah. really well, it's so you work together. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I mean, it, it would be, it would, that's not, I get it, but I think you'd write it better. Okay, no, I would, I'd be happy to kind of look at this and the pretrial monitor in conjunction okay. as, a, as kind of a replacement system for our cash bail system. Great. If they don't want to do cash bail, you can just save it for one dollar, just like when you buy oh, yeah. some of the, yeah. I bought this house for one buck. Right. <laughs> so you still get a little cash, but it's a buck. Right. Anyway, that was just a kid mm -hmm. wanted to get rid of all the Oh, did you? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't even no, think of that. No, it just hits me. Okay. There. Keep going, Gary, if you're, if you're gonna... <laughs> if you're gonna step up, there we go. So, that would be great. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to. Could. It's an issue that, you know, if we worked on a bail bill at great. one point, so we already kind of have a little bit of a head start. On the Great, issues. that would be good. Thank um, you. With respect, two points down with respect to staffing. Um, it looks like you may have left out defense counsel. I think this is. I did. Yeah. Uh, I actually. <laughs> didn't say anything about that. Yeah. I actually, you say additional prosecutors and judges, but I actually think that it's it's everyone. It really is all all folks working together. Yes. Um, 
And with respect to defense counsels, I actually, two points down from that, you, know, you talk about discretion and how implicit bias can make its unacknowledged ways into decisions made by prosecutors, law enforcement, and judges. I also think defense counsel yes. could be included in that list as well. Captain Scott made that point to me in an ex parte conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because when you, you know, implicit bias, as you know, it's when you have caseload, you have to make decisions very quickly all the time. You know, you might accept a deal on behalf of your, I mean, the client has to accept a deal, which might not, but there's other ways that it puts by some defense counsel. Um, and I think that is it. Okay, great, thank you. Dr. Shep. All right, <laughs> so, Looking at, I'll start with this in place. Most people did. I actually have to say, re reading the first paragraph, the white supremacy piece did not actually immediately jump out at me, but having this, you know, heard discussion, one thing that occurs to me is that um, <clears throat> the use of that phrase, I think it's, it's been a rather recent uh, expansion to use it for things that are more commonly referred to as institutional racism or implicit bias and things like that. I could be wrong about the well, it, sort of it just depends on what realm you're in. In critical race theory, say white supremacy is kind of almost dated. It's like 1980s. Um, when I got into critical race theory, and not horribly seriously because I wanted to write symphonies, but um, but I was doing it, and that was a term that floated around all the time, and it didn't. It didn't actually get people riled up. Um, this wasn't actually the term that I was going to pull out for this. This is some from another panelist, um, but um, just so you know that that's kind of background academically. Okay. That no, that's, I certainly wouldn't know that. That is good to know. Um, I think that. I guess what I'm getting at is I do think there are folks who will not perhaps have the exactly. same level of education as I think most no. of the panel does, right. understanding that when we talk about white supremacy, uh, we're not necessarily talking about overt violence, but I do think right. that, that is the uh, phrase that, or that is the meaning that comes to mind mm -hmm. that many people will see, and because of that, it could be a stopping point for folks. Like they'll stop reading. Yeah. And so I think, I have no problem with using the phrase. I, I have no issue with that at all. I do think having um, a bit more preamble to that. Okay. And maybe, you know, a little starting that a little further down is some way okay. that we could accommodate both. Okay. Um, or footnote. Oh, Never mind, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I know, suddenly everyone got no, serious. Um, but yeah, I think that there, at least maybe outside of academia, um, there, there seems to have been like a relatively more recent usage of it to cover a broader range of issues, at least among us uneducated white folk. Well, and you're um, right. I mean, the media's been using it in a way that is very tentative and does not, to my mind, actually describe the nuances and the complexity of the term. But I, you know, I'm not going to fight with Fox News. I'm not going to fight with MSNBC. It, it, it's how they use it. And you, know, you make a good point. If they're going to stop reading, well, that's kind of not helpful. Right. <laughs> right. You need them to read it. I don't think it's harmful to have some education in here, right? To include yeah. that with some education, yeah. but I think that we want to have that in order to make sure we don't put a stop sign up for some folks who are going to be offended, less comfortable. Yeah, even you if use that, the word offended. Yeah, and I, I don't necessarily think it's a it's a legitimate feeling of offense. Oh, of course. Um, no, but, but it doesn't. It is what it is. I mean, right. That's why we're sitting here as a panel. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So that was um, just adding my note to that. Let me get into the dive into the uh, details a little bit more. Um, one thing. So I'll jump right to data collection. Sure. And I will write this into my notes afterwards. Um, I would say one thing that might be helpful is just naming very specifically 
the entities and operators who um, uh, uh, about whom data should be collected. Ah. So um, that I think should include prosecutors, although the prosecutors may be reluctant. It should include uh, police already have a lot of data collection being done, but it could include um, defense attorneys. It could include it should include diversion to name my own agency. Uh, diversion pretrial services, we should be collecting uh, data on this, and we're not. Um, so I think naming some specific entities that are doing work in this area and uh, do not have data collection, but who have a, a lot of power to influence people's lives based on decisions they make, all that data should be collected to the extent we can. Um, I think Connecticut actually just passed a bill that we could use as something of a not necessarily a model to put the whole bill in here, but a model of like who did they require and what what can we look to that. So anyway, okay, being specific about that. So if the legislature proceeds to say, oh, okay, these are the people that we really need to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that be good. I think that well, there was a um, joint legislative justice oversight meeting last fall where they really got into this question. DOC produced a um, report about disparities in incarcerative rates and what the committee very quickly came to was like, all right, DOC is actually doesn't have, it has a little bit of discretion, but actually doesn't have a lot of discretion to determine who is in. There are other people, other actors have a lot of discretion to determine who is in and we need to, and we don't have any data about them other than police. Um, and, we, and we need to do a better job of, of collecting uh, data about the full spectrum of the criminal justice process. So anyway, sorry, okay. that was a bit of a tangent, but uh, something I think is worth so, working on. May I ask you a question at this moment, or do you want to keep going? No, please ask, ask away. You're talking about these entities for whom collection already takes place, and the ones for which it does not. You know those. I do not. I'm happy to help out. I mean, I know you're crazy busy because, like, you disappear for, like, years, but um, is that something that, yeah, yeah I have, yeah. you really can? I'm not being facetious. I mean, you really can? Because if not, just send me the stuff and I'll write. No, I I'm really good at writing about things so I don't even get that. Okay. Okay. Um, so on the next one, so yeah, so this one was one where I feel like we want to have some, and this is a little bit detail-oriented, but I don't want legislators to get confused. There is a difference, I think, when we're talking about um, well, pretrial services versus pretrial monitoring. Pretrial monitoring okay. is an essentially failed program to try to, well, it's, I, I, it's, I don't want to get into that too much, but there was an attempt to add a lot more people to the roles of folks who would have who would otherwise have been incarcerated, but instead are being monitored on the outside through pretrial, through electronic monitoring. Right. When we're talking about pretrial services, it's really, I think there may have been a few years ago some idea that these things might be more related. They really have turned out not to be, and the way that these programs have been run out, pre, uh, uh, ramped up. Pretrial services is really about connecting people to, who are awaiting trial, connecting people to services. Um, such as I can play this on So anyway, sorry. No, no. It's so there's yeah. it's very detail oriented stuff. There's it's hard for people to get right who are in charge of passing the laws. Oh so, dear. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nothing to feel bad about at all. But I, I just want to make sure we're clear when we talk about that. So take out pretrial monitors and simply it's pretrial services. Um. Yes, I want to say. Um, David, I, yeah, I understand you're talking about bail. So I think well, it's well, all so that really will really come connected yeah. into the electronic. So there's another paragraph where we talk about electronic monitoring where I feel like bail is also something. Or we could add a new paragraph about that. That was, I have to say, that was fun to write because I was like Googling everything. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like, what am I talking about? And the Google, you're right, it wasn't even clear then. It's and I kept thinking confusing. I was stupid, and then I just decided lawyers are smarter than I am. No, so it's not, it's just, the problem is that there's no agreed upon terminology. Okay. We are all kind of just, we have, you know, Vermont has its own way of talking about this stuff that frankly is evolving year by year. Okay. So 
it's very hard to know. Uh, the other piece that I wanted to highlight is the risk assessment tool. Yes, is something that uh, is not without controversy. Yes, um, some people feel that it is an important way to baseline what's happening. So you can say, all right, well, this uh, according to this objective input, which you know. According to the subjective input, this should have been the outcome, but this was the outcome in these cases. And it sort of provides a baseline where you can say, well, this person may be deviating consistently from what our validated risk assessment tool shows should have been happening. But there are other folks that feel like whatever subjective inputs go into that risk assessment tool themselves embody um, the sort of background racialized uh, things that happen in society, and so it is baking into the process problems that already exist. And people come out on different sides of the debate, right? I think uh, our sense of it is like, well, yes, that probably is an issue, and it is still helpful to have a baseline to work from, even if that baseline is itself imperfect, because it pulls people at least at least it reduces inconsistency, and consistency to some degree is fairness. Um, but there are people who would really object to my statement that I just made. So I, I just think noting that, uh, that that is something that we have to make a decision about is helpful to highlight. Sure. OK. OK. You're writing that, right? <laughs> yeah, I have it in your trying to I will turn it into okay. minutes at all. Um, I'll add this to my minutes later. E Okay. Um, yeah, the diversion thing, I think, is, I, I think Pepper said the important stuff there. Um, and I would note again, we as a diversion program need to collect data. Which also means that the data collection point has to really be beefed up. It's too short. It's not, it doesn't convey enough. Um, on the electronic monitoring piece, I already said a bit of that. I think uh, it is important on electronic monitoring. Just I would perhaps make a note that we want to be clear that we would electronic monitoring would not. I, I would think that the goal would not be to add supervision or add supervisory burdens to people who would not have otherwise had them. We only want to have this be a substitute for incarceration. And so designing that, that's an important design piece that we want to come that I would assume we want to emphasize, obviously the panel can weigh in as it sees fit. Um, and yes, I think, and just I'd echo again uh, Pepper's point on bail, I think we made some useful changes and we could do a lot more on that. Okay. And that does fit together a little bit. Isn't there a concern that we get away from the risk of flight? It may in fact be increasing the number of people. Yeah, so I mean, the Defender General's in the office, direction. and they can speak for themselves better than I can, but they, I think they would have serious concerns that if you open up the possibility of misdemeanor crimes being eligible to be held without bail, which could happen with a constitutional amendment, but that would be something that they would be vehemently opposed to. Uh, and I would note, like in California, that was actually the subject of serious controversy when they did pass their um, elimination of bail stuff. So none of these things are easy, but I think that um, I, I would certainly, I, I do think we can do more. I think many people would, many people who practice in both systems would say the federal system is a better way of handling mm -hmm. uh, pretrial safety and pretrial detention issues. And whatever we can do to move closer to that, uh, and, and obviously we have to have a balancing with not potentially maybe not losing protections that people have now. I think many people would agree with that. I'm sure that not everybody would, but I do think a lot of folks feel like federal, the federal system does it better and more fairly. They also have a a lot more resources. Well, I was just, I was yeah, really going to slip kind of wait my turn. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you covered the resources issue very nicely in other paragraphs. So, um, anyway, I think that was actually my main. <coughs>
those were my main things. They were kind of like detail oriented stuff, but it's just stuff that I've been working on. Well, good. I mean, put you in a good position to uh, recraft that. So, good. Thank you. No problem. Jeff, are you? Just a couple. Please. Um, uh, like Mr. Shatz, I was initially struck with uh, white, white supremacy. Okay. And, and um, looking at it even beyond tactically in this paper, but strategically, we have an extraordinary window to elected officials. <coughs> we should be strategic in what we're doing. Yes. And, I think that we should be looking at the disparity, not just the people of color, but poor people, because in my experience, cops treat people obviously poor, almost identical to people of color. And I don't know, Gary may, may or may not agree with me, but I certainly, in my life, have seen disparate treatment based on the condition of a vehicle, okay, which is the basis of a stop. So I spent a lot of time sort of brooding on how we could change that word to be more inclusive. And um, I'm not eloquent enough to do so, but if people here could think of that, if they agree that might be effective, I would like to ask that they do so. What, the way we always describe it is disadvantaged people. Good. Now that's the kind because you're. It is dis, you know disadvantaged or disparate. You know disparities, but more more of disadvantaged. Because because if you're talking you're talking white supremacy, then inherently we are more disadvantaged, right? So when you use the word disadvantaged, it means that it could be poor, it could be of color, it could be any any reason why you were less than something. Else, you are disadvantaged. Anyway, do what you want. Yeah, but, uh, institutional discrimination. I, I'm not sure if I come up with a word, but somebody has a mind. You know, I just see it as, a, as an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to uh, fire a broader broadside. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, um, I am. Ignorant proponent of less fail. And I think if we choose to make that recommendation, the simple pitch is it's going to be a lot cheaper to buy a bunch of monitors than to feed people. Okay. Which is a good point that you made. You know, if that's where the panel wants to go, to me, that's just a simple sales. Then we're, we're writing a sales document, right? Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My remarks will be a little bit brief as well. Um, seems like pretty universally the phrase white supremacy. I used it in well, a lot. And, and so. the conversation that Jen and I had after reading that was, I read a lot of research papers, what's the operational definition? Because I Googled the phrase and you can imagine. There's a lot of disagreement. It generally, oh good, I'm going to do it. Um, a system by which society is organized to give preference to the concerns of whiteness. Right. And that's one of the definitions of the right. right. one related to the Ku Klux Klan and all, right? So in, yeah. in terms of this, this paper is a product of this committee. Whatever we decide, decide to keep it, decide um, not to keep it, but you can craft it a operation an operational definition specifically for the purposes of this paper. Yes. If that's too one key. Um, so that was kind of one observation that jumped out. Okay. Um, the other thing that I think would probably be helpful if we talk about the head collection is I'll give Karen a call and get a sample of the legislation that she's proposing and I'll forward that. It might be worthy of inclusion in this because that's Legislature will read that, maybe that will ping on the radar again. Uh, but I think that that goes in there, or, or that, that's a good thing that could, mm -hmm. could see where we do that. And the other thing that uh, I, I kind of keyed on as I 
uh, looked at this was not too long ago, uh, my counterparts around the country, granted, there's only 50 of us in the state, went to a, uh, a symposium in D.C., specifically around the 21st century report on policing. And the number one thing that leaps out when you're talking policy, when you're talking training, when you're talking all that sort of stuff, is that agency culture eats everything. I'm sorry, say that again? Agency culture eats everything. Okay. So it's not uncommon for us to train to the best standards. They go to an agency. And one of the things that we've heard is that some of the members of the agency are, I forget all that shit you at the academy. This is the way it is in the real world. Well, that's, that's counterproductive. And, uh, but when you look at changing agency culture, it's been done in Vermont. We change agency culture around domestic violence response. We change agency culture around a number of things, but it's a longer term goal. And it usually, you have to look at it in terms of a couple of leadership generations, which are five, six, seven years as people move up with the agencies. And when I was um, pleading for extra help last, <laughs> last session, um, one of the things I pointed out is that we don't have the ability to craft supervisory training courses unique to Vermont. And that's, you start at the first line supervision and work your way up, and that's where you begin to implant those, those sorts of things that generate culture change. Um, and this may not be the appropriate paper for it, but it's, it's the thing that leaked out at me, because you're looking at potentially much Expanded period of time. I mean, this this is not a quick legislative fix. This is a this is a cultural shift mm -hmm. that can be done in Vermont. Has been done in Vermont. I've seen it, um, but it's it has to be a purposeful, driven project. Here's our end goal: culture change. So, but for whatever that's whatever value that is, it kind of throw that out there because mm -hmm. I, I see some of the stuff. Well, one of the things that, that kind of jumps out is the most common entry point into the system for everybody is through the local police. So if you're talking about discretion, decision-making points, and, and those sorts of things, uh, that's an area that's, that's rich with, uh, with those sorts of decision-making opportunities. And there is a, I, I beat this drum so long, it's getting afraid of the edges, but there is an opportunity to really have an impact on uh, uh, officers who are just entering the system, or more importantly, just beginning their supervisory careers. You probably heard me say that about five, six hundred times. I, I, I mean, I agree with that one hundred percent. So it's just that's, and, they, and the funding was cut for even, even to just touch upon this. So that that's you know, one of those areas of concern that. You know, if it's a priority, but the funding gets cut frequently, mm -hmm. over again, so it's... Is there anything in the academy to train people for a supervisory role? Or is it all at the discretion of the local PD? Uh, every, every few years, the academy puts on a first-line supervision course, but right now it's, it's geared towards the mechanics of supervising, uh, particularly dealing with um, challenged personnel. And sorts of policy issues. It's normally a three-day course. I think that we're easily looking at a five-day course, if not a flat 10-day, two-week course, to start being much more, I hate to use the word global, but I think you know what I'm getting at. Look at, look at, instead of looking at your police department, look at the system. Look at the chain of events from when you first make that decision on down the line and, and those sorts of things. I think that we're not capturing that, it's not that we're not aware of it, it's I don't have the money or the staff to do it and it really grates me. I mention it at the finance every year at budget time and every year I get the, well, you know, Vermont has some really tough All right. Thank you. I didn't write anything. You're writing though, right, David? Yeah. Okay, because I was just sort of digesting that. But. The funding, I, I have to, 
I don't know. I, don't, I tried writing something as powerful as I could at that moment and sort of used that metaphor of a household and you just have to make certain things be important and other things are not and that's a choice. Um, but I feel like it's all going back to that and we're really, I, I don't know, if anybody has any ideas about how to beef that up, that would be great because what I'm getting as a takeaway right now is none of this is going to work without. I think the funding or the lack of funding or resource goes without saying. Right. So I'm not sure we have to put it in here Okay. in an attempt to, you know, okay. increase the plea. I mean, I'm thinking we take it out or reduce it down because it's going to be obvious with the other parts of this. Okay. Or that we are we need resources, whether it's for training or data collection, right, or whatever. Um, and so I think it, it speaks for itself. I think okay. the report can speak for itself. But that, that's my sense. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So it's my first meeting, so I don't know that I have a whole lot to offer on this. Well, other than I, I may be part of the group that you're aiming this at because I haven't been here and I don't know what we've been talking about. So this is my first my first exposure. Um, so. One thing that stuck out to me is that we, you talk in data collection, data collection across all state agencies. As someone who's not been part of these conversations, for me it would be helpful to know what data you're looking for and from whom. Well, that that and was to, part to flesh of flesh that out. Um, like okay, uh, like just some places that I personally might want to see some data collected. Um, school punishment for kids that are who's who's going. You know, who's getting detention, who's getting suspended, who's getting kicked out of school altogether, that sort of thing. Um, you could also get some, some data around victim services from the Vermont network. Um, we, I, that, used, that was my former gig. Um, we collected um, perception data or self-disclosed uh, by the client data for years and years. I don't know if they've retained it, but that's what's out there. Um, and the other thing, that popped into my head is just because I'm a little bit of an NPR nerd. And I know we want to do, it seems like the goal of the electronic monitoring is to keep people from having to go to jail for funding. Um, it never occurred to me that anybody other than the state would pay for electronic monitoring, but apparently it's become an economic justice issue in and of itself because folks come in this and say, hey, you don't want to spend that much money on electronic monitoring, am I going to deal for you? Our company will set up a shop here next to probation and parole. You send folks over, and for the, the they cost you nothing, and we'll handle all of it. But it ends up costing the person like seventy bucks a week. So, that's all. I have. Okay. So, just for clarification, mm -hmm. it reads: We have seen a lack of standardization across the state and mm -hmm. the data points being collected. Mm -hmm those collecting the data, and how the categories of data are defined. Thus, the panel recommends the standardization of data collection across all state agencies. It further and logically asks that resources be allocated to assist in the collection of this data. What do you want to change? I guess for me, all state agencies is such a broad brush. There are a lot of them. Yeah, I, maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not able to adequately say what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to get at what you're yeah, trying to say because I want to change we may it. Not, we, I may have to ruminate on it and email you or. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah, fine. All state agencies within our purview, like the criminal justice agency. There, you're right. talking about all state agencies. Well, I don't know what's in your head. Like, okay, you know, the Department of Transportation. Yeah, all like, state agencies so, is a broad brush if you're looking at it in that way. Buildings and yeah, like buildings and general services who mow the lawn at the academy. Oh, it's yeah, it's not, yeah, I think it's only within the it's, criminal juvenile justice. Okay, system. yeah, gotcha. So maybe that was my. Since I'll also be making some suggestions on this, bit, I'd be happy to work sure. with you to think about what other stuff we should be adding in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think you know, like the school punishment issue. That, you know, that clearly fits in with juvenile justice. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point that we should. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We should put in there. There actually yeah. is some data being collected, but we should still yeah. put that in there. Okay. The Civil Rights Commission, they just had a uh, <coughs> they, they, Yeah, they've been focused on that. Recently. The school to prison, I think they're calling the school yeah. to prison. Like, so. 
Okay, she's done. I was going to pick on David and say, well, you know, with all the settlements that they get through the AG's office, why couldn't they kick some of it this way to fund or something? <laughs> Instead of electric cars, you know, half and half. You know, half electric cars, half juvenile justice. Pay. If you could convince the legislature to let us keep all of the money, <laughs> <laughs> we would have to pay to do that. It's just called reallocation. You don't have to keep it. You can just it only goes right to the general fund. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I just want to have yeah. fun there. Um, I think, like I said, uh, or like everybody said, it's, it's, it was written really well. Uh, I think we could probably back off a little bit on some of the flowery stuff. I wasn't too sure about the bay window and the wood. There it's a metaphor. <laughs> 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 And I think, you know, we have to be careful about making assumptions, going back to your points, that it's really a prioritization and not that there's so much sometimes a lack of resources. Mm -hmm. It's like if they if they think it's important to fund telecommuters to come to Vermont, that's a priority that they're making. If they're thinking of funding uh, body cameras or something like that, then that's a priority. I think it's a matter of putting whatever priority that they feel that is important to, to solve the issue. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not, so I, I don't know if we should just give them an out by saying, oh, well, we know there's lack of resources. So, oh yeah, that's why we can't do it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if we wanna um, kind of say, well, this is this has to be a priority if you want things to change, or instead of saying there's lack of, lack of, lack of resources or whatever. I think they, they need to find the funds if they want to do it. Um, I know we mentioned previously that we thought that the point that we were heading down was having the Human Rights Commission collect the data, but I didn't really see, is there any- Oh my God, I totally forgot to hear that. We, we had all of those meetings about trying to have the Human Rights Commission do the data collection, or be the focal point that all the data went to, and then we, they were gonna to try to hire somebody to do the crunching of the numbers and the data and all that. So I didn't know if we could add that in here. On the yeah, program. I'm sorry, I didn't No, no, I just throw that we in. had a lot of meetings with them coming in. That's a bullet point. It yeah. just is on a different part of the computer, sorry. Okay. And no, was no. it data collection or was it? It wasn't data it was collection. Was complaint. Like, it, was complaint. it was complaints. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but I didn't know if it might also yeah. include, you know, maybe doing the data, being the focal point for the data collection. Because one, one comment I want to, because I deal a lot with legislators and a lot with legislative bills. You walk in and it's great to do some overall general things and assumptions. They just want to say, just tell me the problem, tell me how to fix it, and then we'll have a debate about it and we'll move on. Because they don't want to make that decision on how to fix it because that that's they're not going to. They're just not going to. They're not going to say, well, you know, this would be good if you did this. They're looking at us as a panel to make those recommendations that if you do X, Y, and Z, this will solve the problem. And then they will have to debate that, but they want solutions, they don't want to come up with them. So we, I, I go back to the point where we have to have concrete, like you were saying, concrete recommendations, because that's really what we're here, is we have to make those so they can say, yeah, that will work, or yeah. But if they say it won't work, then we say, well, this is why we say it'll work, and why do you say it won't? You know, that kind of thing, because there will be a debate on it. Um, so I, I think we need to be specific on recommendations of what they need to do. That's fine. I'm going to go back to the email that I sent out with this, which said, I heard that when we everybody said it at whatever meeting that was, what is on here, and I, you can go back through everything I did, represents where we got. If there was, if I wrote, we said we should have a conversation about this, or you all should have a conversation. It's because there was no recommendation that was concrete. Well, and I'm not saying that uh, this is all great. I'm just saying, I'm just suggesting that it's fine. part of what we need to do uh, is, is to make some sort of uh, concrete recommendation and why we're making those recommendations. Mm -hmm. Whether it be copying it from other stuff that's been successful or whatever, whatever it is. Okay. Um, I think another way would be nice in the data collection point is I don't know if we capture why they came into the system. Now I know that's subjective, but 
was it because they were strung out on drugs and maybe they should go to a, uh, uh, a rehabilitation instead of going to court? Was it because they, they stole because they didn't have any money? Or is it because they just like to steal? Or, I mean, we're not collecting any information from the person itself to try to find out what, is there a trend? Because we know a lot of people are ending up in the criminal system because of opiates. Right? They're trying to supply their habit. Well, we know that only because it's so overwhelming that we know that, you know, when the, when the state stands up and says, these people don't deserve jail, they deserve treatment. It's because we're so overwhelmed, we know that that's what's causing them to come into the system. So is there a way, I don't know how or what point we collect information from that person saying kind of what your situation is. Are you habitual just because you have an addiction problem of stealing or is it because of drugs, it's a one-time shot or are you coming in because ICE arrested you or something? I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I don't know where that point is, but we should at least make a note of how do we, can we get to that and to maybe subject them. I don't know. But at least there's, there's a baseline to start to see if there's trends. Um, I think um, just a point of clarification, I think we should make sure that in the document we say director of racial equity, because I think they changed that from chief officer. I think. What I've. Was it there? Did they change that to director of racial equity? Well, I met her the other day, and she was introduced as the racial equity executive director. Okay, because over here it said like officer. It said like chief racial yeah. equity and diversity officer. I just wrote something. No, 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 I understand. Who should hire us? That's our next business. Yeah. I will talk about that. But that's, all, that's basically all I had. Other than that, it was great. I think uh, if we can find more meat, when are we looking to get this cemented? Because it's for this legislative session, right? I'm. And who's going to spot? Who's going to be this? You have to. Are you going to pick up a legislator to do that sponsorship for that bill? Because we should start talking to those legislators. Or is that just coming from? Well, I think you know, Aton will submit it as the chair of the panel to to just a panel of. Well, to oh, yeah. Tim Ash and yeah. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, if we can take this report to a point where we're all firmly yeah. supportive of it, to your previous point, I think that we should have a legislative strategy for rolling this out, getting key legislators on board, and presenting it potentially to the Joint Justice Oversight. And of course, you know, if we need one legislation before, we might want to pre prepare or work with Ledge Council before December 15th. Yep. And uh, I think that, you know, Unless we do that, it's going to sit on a shelf. Right. Well, that's why I was thinking because they right. usually submit it to legal to draft it and then yeah. give it to the committee. You said December fifteenth. Is that right? That's the deadline for yeah, drafting. For yeah, because it's yes. the middle. Oh, okay. So we might want to just. After yeah, it's really early. <laughs> it's, it's only July now, but that day will quickly. It'll, it'll happen very quickly. It will come. Yeah. yeah, and I I feel like we're on a good. Yeah, I think we're on a good track because there's a lot of meat in here. We just gotta. Okay. Hone it down yep. to some yep. specific recommendations. Yep. Even if that's the ending conclusion, here are the recommendations. You know, you have all this, but a conclusion saying here are our final right. recommendations, and then okay. okay. pull it. Yeah. Okay. And you know, actually, do you think um, joint, reaching out to Joint Justice Oversight ahead of time and asking to they're having a bunch of meetings this year and asking staff to. So many meetings. But it's good because they should be able to find an, uh, an hour or two for us to come in. Or I'd hope here, so. Or right? so yeah. yeah. Come in to say, here it is. You guys yeah. asked for this. You've been waiting for it. Here it is. And let's talk about what, yeah. or you guys, since you're legislators, talk about what bills you can attach stuff to or new bills that right. need to be written, whatever it has to be. Right. Okay. Well, and if there's, if there's mandates anyway, they have to take it up at least. Whether they show it in committee or not, it's a different story, but they have to at least look at it, right? If there's a mandate, I don't know if there is. I can't remember if there's a mandate. Don't take the report seriously. Okay. They're interested in this. All right. Judge Chris. So I'll try not to repeat things that have been said, but I, I will say uh, at the outset, hey, Tom, that um, you really did an amazing job putting oh. this together. No, I, mean, it, it, I think it's hit. Uh, certainly the issues that we've been discussing and uh, really picked up the, the flavor of, of these topics. Good. Uh, That's what it needed to do. You know, I to, to echo some of the other comments, though, I, I was taken by um, 
your comment about the, the 1980s connotation of white supremacy, which I had not heard before. Mm -hmm. But I'm also mindful of Jeff's comments. Indeed. It, it's a different connotation now. And I I looked at this document, and I read it through quickly, and I'll go through it again. But I always look at, what is the audience? What, what audience am I trying to reach? And I think if we can find some language that we're all comfortable with, mm -hmm. other than white supremacy, mm -hmm. Will at least eliminate, uh, you know, somebody reading that first paragraph and going, I don't want to look at it. And I don't want to. And, and I think really that should be our goal. I we, agree. We, I think there's a way of defining it. And some suggestions have been made uh, to include the term, but a, a broader definition. And Fine. We won't lose people from the outset. So, um, okay. Uh, that was my initial thought on the first paragraph. The second one, as I said, um, I, I think it goes without saying that. Um, Resource issue, but I like uh, what the chief said about let's just make this a priority. And I think we can emphasize the fact that if we look at uh, what has happened just in the last couple of years in this mm -hmm. panel the creation of the, of the uh, new office. Right. Uh, and that says to me that the legislature does see this as a priority. And I think we emphasize this as a priority as opposed to the lack of resources. Okay. Um, that would get us there. On, on the top of page three, when we talk about better data collection, I don't dispute the need for it. What I didn't understand was the lack of standardization across the state. Uh, because each entity, whether it's the judiciary or the correction or state police or DCF, everybody collects mm -hmm. different data for different reasons. There may be some common thread to it. So I'm not sure what it means to standardize that collection across all agencies, because we, we are looking I can, see, yeah. So I just think we need to understand what okay. what that what what we mean by that. Okay. And there there may certainly be common uh, data. Um, it was a point that was raised. Actually, Rebecca, you raised it <laughs> about four months ago, um, five months ago, about standardization of the data points. Is that, I, I know, I'm putting I know, you on the spot, but. I don't but recall standardization in the context of DOC. No, and I, I remember what you were saying. You remember what you were saying. There was a situation So I misunderstood. The authority wasn't using a standardized identification mechanism. Um, okay, thank you. No, I misunderstood. But, but I also think. The judges won't just, won't take it. It's a very good point. Thank you. I think, I think there's a point to that where we're yeah. trying to say, like, if the state police is looking at this person, are they being looked at the same way across? I guess maybe that's right. how I understood those conversations. Okay. Um, I look I'll at, look at that. Yeah, I look at the next paragraph about pretrial, what do you call it? Pretrial monitors, pretrial services, or going on to the next page about um, electronic monitoring. Uh -huh. I think they're all, they're all happening at the same point in time criminal justice process, I have to agree that if we could have a federal system, we'd all be ahead of the game. But right. that is a tremendous resource. And it starts with the pretrial services being embedded in the federal judiciary. Mm -hmm. It is not relying on DOC or mm -hmm. corrections or any or pretrial services out of the AG's office. Mm -hmm. It is a centralized office that the court controls. Right. And is, I would be the first to say that they can send people we're in charge of defenses in Vermont. They send them to other states without yeah. concern because of the, uh, we're a long ways from that. Um, and I, I would like to see our pretrial services improve, but again, it's resources. Right. The electronic monitoring, to me, is a, an interesting discussion. And I'm sure the numbers vary from day to day, but there's essentially 20 to 25 on misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. And the bulk of it are, are felonies. Right. And I don't see a lot of requests for electronic monitoring even for those felony cases. So it's an under it's underused now. I don't know if that's your sense, Rebecca, but we just don't see that many requests for it. And I think what we really need to be careful is that we don't, as someone suggested, that we put more people on electronic monitoring don't need to be on electronic monitoring um, because we've got to look at the population that we're trying to target with that. Um, and, and so I just think we have to 
Okay. Have to be careful when we are looking at that. Um, the, the next paragraph talks about the sentencing. Yeah. Um, and the point in the middle of it where it says uh, further, although the court can reject a plea agreement, where it is, well, I'm sure that comes from me. It does. It does. <laughs> and I don't heard you say that. I don't have a problem with that. So it's, the next, it's the next clause, mostly because of directed knowledge. I think what I was trying to say was at that point, it, it's pretty much the, the state and the defense have a better understanding of the right. facts as they appear at that point. Uh, it may be completely different than okay. what I was trying to say. Um, okay. And the only other one, oh, when you get on to uh, page five, the discretion is a cornerstone. And I'll go back to. That was on Google all crazy. Well, the, what I wanted to say there is we recommend the last line, a system of external accountability be established. That's about four people. And I'm not sure how that's going to who, who is to be accountable to that system because uh, prosecutors are subject to uh, ethical obligations, the judiciary is, the state mm -hmm. police. Um, so I just wasn't sure how that would actually mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't make one last stab for more discretion on the version. And it doesn't have to be all or nothing. <laughs> um, <coughs> look at limiting it to misdemeanors. So the state's attorney would have to break. We're going to get the, the courthouse away on that. I'm so glad we're going to break into subcommittees. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to send you all out of my newest thought today. <laughs> on that, on that story. Okay, thank you. Your turn. My turn. Okay. Um, so, of course, I have more to think about because if I'm totally oh, well, out of the list here. I know. Um, I, well, yeah. poor Jessica. That's true. But I will say that I'm learning a lot from you about how to sit here while well, pick apart documents that I write. Um, oh, my hand is not in this. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and it's just great. I love it because it's a little nicer we can just sort of share. God, well, it won't work unless yeah. we do that. So I also, um, I don't have anything else to add other than to say that I share all of those comments. Great. I don't know. It's probably, I don't think we need to talk about that anymore. Okay. You know, I feel like we'll come to a really great resolution on how we want to improve that sure. in here. Um, I think then uh, data collection is certainly one of the topics that I have a lot of interest in. And um, I notice here, of course, the issue of standardization, which I think is may or may not be the right way of saying it. Okay. But I want to think about saying it because, it, as Judge Pearson just mentioned, we all collect similar types of data. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if they're sort of making sure that people are collecting similar types of data and there's a way that we can report it in a standardized way. This, there's nothing in here about reporting. We talked no. about collecting data and there's no nothing about what we are going to do after we collect the data. Um, which I think is really critical to the work that we're doing. Um, and I also think that it's not really just about having and some objective outside entity sort of collecting. The, the way I read it was like, oh, all we need is an outside entity that's going to collect the data, and all of our data collection problems will be solved. That's <coughs> really not true either, because every organization and department is going to also need to look at its own internal system and processes and resources. And it's slightly touched on here, but I feel like that's the bigger issue okay. um, than having you know someone like a CRG or some other mm -hmm. be the people who are on the receiving end of that. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to be on a data collection set committee group to okay. work on that. Um, that's a question. So yeah, I know we. How long, this committee has formed for quite some time, right? Like a number of years, right? It's indefinite, right? Yeah. Well, well, oh, it is? Yeah, it is. Well, 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 no, the reason, the reason I'm it's not here is to Well, I don't want to talk to TJ. He said, yeah, you'll be on it for a few years. And I'm like, okay. Or 
or how many, whatever years it was, uh, but like six or four, what, I can't even remember, but it was years, it wasn't like, a, mm -hmm. my question is, is, because right now our charge is to do this, mm -hmm. but at some point, wouldn't, I'm asking the question, what some of those recommendations are, is our panel would be reviewing some of those data or the reports and making continuous recommendations like the long-term stuff like you're talking well, about. And we have to do this every two years. Oh. Okay. Well, then it goes back to the long-term goals that you were talking about of inserting things. I'm just asking you what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, no, it, it, it's biennial. It is. So I read it. So they wrote most of the statute and then put in a sunset at the very end of the process of writing the statute that didn't take into account a bunch of the um, <coughs> time lines in the earlier part of the statute. Oh, interesting. So the sunset cuts off all, a bunch of these other deadlines, like the biennial oh. report. Yeah. The Don't listen to when it's the sunset. It's soon. It's like next year or the year after. They always oh, tell you, okay. the legislature, okay. they always tell you they just put sunsets in front of the thing, yeah. but they never OK. But anyway, I want to ask a question. <coughs> Part of what you were talking about with reporting and who's going to do anything with this, I didn't know if that's something that we are supposed to be doing at some point or not, or if it's somebody like the racial equity director. I, I don't think that's clear. We're only really looking short term yeah. at the yeah. requirement, so I just didn't know. I think that the data collection and report, it's important, and I, and I spend a tremendous amount of time answering other people's questions about data, so I, I kind of in this on a regular basis. And so I really feel like it's important for us, you know, to state that it's important, but also that I think it requires a whole lot of other expertise and um, other people looking at what it would take to actually put together a reporting system that Vermont would feel comfortable with. And I think we would, we would need to sort of convene a group of experts who could really help us design that that was the money. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's, so that's one potential recommendation that we could mm -hmm. uh, consider. Um, I do think the idea of pretrial and home uh, electronic monitoring are very intertwined, and the question's been a lot that's gone on um, in the past few years with pretrial, having it moved around the state, the difference between monitors and um, services, and also this whole other body of work that's happening with the National Criminal Justice Reform Project. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and none of that's really sort of captured in here. Um, and it may or may or not need to be, but the point I was trying to, I don't know if we should make the point that there's been a lot of work done in some of these areas that's not really captured. Um, and some people may not know this, that all of the History and background about what we have tried and what we've been trying to do and what's sort of in the works. If there's a way to sort of keep that, that might be helpful. Okay. Um, with electronic monitoring, uh, again, I've spent a lot of time on this particular topic, and I um, actually do not wonder whether or not the expansion of electronic monitoring would decrease the detention population because um, it hasn't. Well, I don't, Let's take that. <laughs> I don't wonder that. Um, I mean, it, it, under its current, um, under the way it's currently designed, okay. it's not, and it's cost the state money to do that. Uh, so, if it's designed differently, perhaps it could, but we would need to think about it. Okay. So I have to this particular okay. All right. Actually, we're, we're talks in there about um, hold without bail. Yeah. The only people who are on are like, were right. right without bail. Yeah. The so the legislature the, made a specific. We don't want that. That's not what we intended, and therefore they purposely. There's 13 people today on electronic monitoring. They're probably, all, They're probably all the same people who were on it um, sure they are. when we could put people who were held without doing electronic okay. monitoring. See the reason? Because <laughs> I was I was the one that kind of really 
kind of push for yeah. this. And the reason I did that is I figure people who are generally poor or, or disadvantaged can't afford the bail. So then they're held and then they lose their job and there's nobody to help support the family. Now this may be all subjective, but I'm just saying is, is that whereas it's somebody who can afford to get bailed out, then they can go about their way, they can continue to feed their family, they don't lose their job, they continue to work, and it doesn't collapse the family. And that's where I was going with it because, I mean, obviously if you put an ankle brakes on somebody and say you can't leave your house, well that doesn't help because my thought process was they're poor already and they can't afford bail, that this would still allow them to, to continue to work, going from work to home to home to work, so they could still they could still provide for their family and they would still be able to pay for things until their court date was coming up. That's that was the reason behind it. Now I don't know if that works the way that way now because I'm not in the juvenile justice system. But I was thinking that was where the benefit could be. Um, but like I said, I'm just going on what I'm thinking, not what might be actual, like what you guys. Now, are they not doing it because nobody saw them to do this, or they just there's just somebody that's the only request? Yeah, I think there's just a uh, there's a whole lot of there's nuance lot. around the program, the, around the way it's designed, the way okay. it's used, who mm -hmm. who who should be eligible for it and not eligible for it, okay. um, and that. I don't have that kind of knowledge yeah. or detail. Yeah, the the current design and structure of it is um, not achieving what the intention was, right? Which is to release more people from detention um, to reduce, you know, yeah. department that corrections budget and to right. have people um, be out in the community. You know what I'm going to ask, don't you? Yeah, and I'm happy to be part of it. <laughs> No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that I should chair the subcommittee. I just, um, just yes, I will, work I will, I will, I will. And this goes yes. to everybody. Whatever you work up, just send it to me. Yeah. Just email it to me, and I'll, I'll smush it all yeah. back where it needs to yeah. go or where it might need to go. I think, I think there's, there's a lot more to it, and I do think, you know, when we, around the table, we talk a lot about the idea of bail reform, and I think that's right. important. Yeah. So, okay. So I only have uh, two points. I think the page two of the training, when we look at the, bo the bottom of the expansion, uh, I think that was something we talked a lot about, about knowing your rights and how we're going to do some community. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's already groups that we've had come in that I think we can push that off to, like the HRC, Vermont Legal Aid, and the ACLU can sort of take ownership of some of that stuff, which I think this past weekend, seeing some of the immigration stuff, there was so much on social media that the ACLU was pushing out that I think that, that kind of falls in. We can kind of maybe okay. pull that into that. And then along the lines of, yeah, along those lines, I just, within the last two weeks, a, a pamphlet, it's not a pamphlet, it's a small booklet that the VPA puts out. I'll no. bring it to the next meeting. Please. Because it's kind of like, now you've turned 18. This is what you need to know. Yeah, exactly. Like senior yeah. survival. I, I should have brought it tonight, um, but I'll bring it because I think it, okay. it's a lot of that. So I think we can just sort of tie it. I think it's just a matter of we should tie the resources together in that point there. Like these resources are out there, but we can make sure that we are pushing them out to the right place and people know they exist. That's really the point. I guess people just don't know where to go. Okay. Uh, and I guess that also goes with the complaint part of that too, where they don't feel like they can make a complaint to the state police because they feel like it will be covered up. Right. Well, you can go to these resources and they can start to get that ball rolling right. for you in some way if you okay. don't feel like that. So okay. that's sort of what I thought. And then also this part, which I think we call training, is that's a struggle that we go through frequently of what is actually working and how do we, you know, this is a lot of this is so subjective. So how do we, as a state, sort of look at what is going to be, what training really looks like in these areas. And as we sort of, as an agency, struggled through some ways to sort of uh, figure that out. It's been challenging in a lot of ways. What really is working and we look at data, we haven't seen some different changes. And some areas we're happy with, but the data isn't necessarily supporting it. So sometimes it's like, okay. what are we missing? So I don't know how we put that together. I just okay. that's a thought. And then the data section, again, uh, as my other point is, 
I'm going to remind you that, that uh, there's so many things we've learned just by getting to this point and putting this together that so many agencies, if they're just going to fall into it and realize just the starting point of what you're capturing, uh, you know, how to capture it, make sure it's centralized in a way that everyone's doing it, I think, uh, and consistent. And so I think that is just a huge topic of whatever agency is going to be capturing it. Is it, you know, is an apple an apple through the whole way? It doesn't meet a lot of these parts because later on that one produce something, as we've learned as an agency, that you're going to get, you, you, be, you, know, you may not be knowing of what you're about to get hit with, you know, because, you know, at a point you thought you were doing something and then you, you completely missed the point in so many parts and other people. So I think that data can be such a, in what people pull from it, you know, just the, the back end political sort of talking points mm -hmm. that get put on the news, data has, a, it's very powerful. Okay. So it's just something we need to, I think. Okay. I think yeah, which is probably why it sort of creates that sort of some anxiety. Yeah, some anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, for sure. Great. That's Thank you. you. Jessica. Hello. <laughs> Last but not least. of the, the process 
arrest, you know, from whether it be traffic stop or some other lead up to an arrest, and then, you know, arraignment and deciding on bail or diverting something before it even gets to arraignment. Like, I think it's important to outline sort of all of the different points in the process where there is the risk of disparity based on race or where we actually have data that shows disparity based on race. And, you know, to the extent that we have some data, maybe include some data to illustrate racial disparity that we've seen at each of these stages. So then you can go on to talk, as Aton has sort of started to do, to outline how we want to address racial disparity at each of these stages. And the last thing I'll say is just, I, I appreciate it. I don't, sorry, I don't know who made the point, but I appreciate it, um, whoever brought up that we, uh, it's very easy, it's been very easy for us to sort of talk as if we are just focusing on the adult criminal system, yeah. but I think it's really important to um, outline uh, the parallels in the juvenile justice system and the different stages um, where we need to address disparity in the juvenile system as well. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving right along because it's like eight. Uh, <coughs> Oh, I'll just be a fascist. There's no public commentary. Um, we have no public. Um, new business, which was actually a little. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, this is an aside. Um, everybody here, people in here, may not be aware that I'm on the board of the money. It's not you. So if it's a resource, a contact, or you'd like somebody to be here somewhere, I've got. Well, this is this is a new business, actually. Believe it or not. Some people knew it before. Well, I know. Well, so it's not <laughs> <laughs> um, I met Susanna Smith on Saturday. Curtis Reed's um, organization down in Brattleboro had a meet and greet breakfast with her. And she is dynamic, energetic, really smart, um, thoughtful, Profoundly well spoken and eloquent. I think she will be a joy to work with. And one of the things I want you to know that I mean, she doesn't start till the 29th. Um, I invited her tonight anyway, which she just looked, but she gave me a look that was like, I am moving here from New York. Do you know what this entails? And I was like, yeah, I kind of do. So she's not here, but. She, as soon as she gets an email address, um, I will certainly invite her. I told her, you know, we'd meet in August. It'd be great to see her here. She looked very enthusiastic about it. She even said to all of us who were there, you know, I need to hear from you because I work for you, which I thought was just really lovely. And I, I don't know, my heart left. Um, the other thing on this, though, that I'd like everyone to think about, and David, you should perk your ears up for this, is when Act 54 went through and we were created, that position didn't exist. I am, in short, wondering whether that should be a position that should simply be part of this panel, the Racial Equity Executive Director. I don't know what we have to do to do that, if we want to do that. We certainly don't have time to have this discussion now. Please think about it for our next meeting. I will put it on the agenda. But that is something that occurred to me, and it seems, it seems important. Um, the second point is I have been in a lot of conversation with Stephanie Seguino. She is concerned. We were emailing. Um, I believe that legislation that requires traffic stop data collection should be revised. I would hope this could be taken up at the next legislative session. In preparation for that, I'm wondering if it would be helpful for me to talk with your committee or perhaps to write a brief that describes the changes that I think need to be made and then share that with your committee, given that it's going to make recommendations on criminal justice reform. So she and I went back and forth on this a bunch. Um, she, I, so I said, please come, because of course, I think this does dovetail very neatly with what we're doing. Um, hope I didn't overstep. In any event, she can't come in August. She'll be out of town. She's going to come in September. It gives her time also to talk with a couple of her colleagues about exactly how those recommendations should be made. 
She will submit something to me in writing, I'll disseminate it to you, and then she'll come and speak to us. So that's the second point. The third point gets to what you just mentioned, which is the Act 54 really very specifically mentions the Vermont chapter of the ACLU again, giving input onto what's going on here. Um, I have not been in touch with either Chloe or Jay Diaz. Chloe's um, gone. Chloe's gone? Yes, who's the new Chloe? Who is the new Chloe? Yes, there's a new hire. There is a new hire. Um, the name, I'm old, 71, I don't remember. But <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 I, I'm sorry, I really can't remember, but yes, there is. I, I will get you that video. Okay. Because I would forward this report <coughs> draft to them if that seems reasonable, just to get their viewpoint in, given that the statute's pretty clear. Send it directly to Duff. Pardon? J Lyle, send it directly to Duff. Okay. I'll, I'll contact you. Okay. All right. Um, that's it for new business. That happened quickly. Oh, um, could I suggest yes. that before we all break for a new meeting date and adjourn, figure out quickly and formally the who wants to work with whom? Um, Go, yes. Well, I, I would like to be a part of the bail. I mean, we're the bail. This is the, the things that we can't get into deep ways that are in our organizations have our positions at the state house every session. So we should try to get together and see if we can find any common ground. Um, whether it's what is it so I'd like to do work with you guys on bail and the um, monitors, pretrial services, what, what is it? Oh, sentencing. We didn't talk about sentencing, but I'd like to approve the work to work on sentencing and I would. Would it how is this for a suggestion for moving forward? How about if there are any, I think folks have already stated things that they they know what they should each be working on. Email A time and myself. Uh, which subjects you would like to be a part of, and we will put together the list, yes. and then you know that back out, and so then you'll hopefully by the end of this week you'll have your assignment of right. which thing or things you're yes. going to be, and who you're going to be working on those things with. Okay. I love Jess's point, though. If we do want to go broader and not limit ourselves to the subject headings that you prepare, we'll go not necessarily using mine as the fix, but you know it, it was expensive. So if there's something we haven't talked about, so we want to. Have yeah, I, this was not meant to be prescriptive. It was that is in the notes also the idea of having that something like that list or the actual mm -hmm. time overview. Um, and I also, if I could, I think the point about juvenile justice that Jessica also mentioned. Yes, I appreciate that. So we haven't really talked about that much, and obviously there's overlap to be sure, but it may be something that we don't have a lot of. To, to and this report may not make sense, but if we are creating new subcommittees, it may make sense to think about that as a separate subcommittee. Right. 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 What's going on in the criminal justice system? Right. We've been 18 and 19 year old. Yes, right. right. Youth offender. So, yes, I think. And it doesn't mind if you suggest maybe creating a subcommittee, but really looking that more for the future. Okay. That's all right. So, you're all going to write to David or myself about what you want to do for the subcommittee. I'm not going to micromanage them. <laughs> um, and then we'll get back to you. Anything else? No? OK, thank you for a very productive meeting. Uh, anyone want to move that we adjourn? Like about 15 of you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want a second? Sure. There it was. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Bye. <laughs>